Lime Books present Overpopulation. Episode two: Occipital Worm. Scene five: The Prince of Darkness. Of all the real estate along Mayfair's platinum edge, there is one building that sits at forty-five degrees to Park Lane, the Dorchester Hotel, an Art Deco butter-coloured layer cake of a building, like a postcard from Monte Carlo, turning heads like Annabel Wallace. What's said of the rich who frequent this salubrious address is their desire to be seen amongst their peers, yet. To remain in splendid isolation from them, against this better instinct, Banks left Zara in Florence and returned to London. Whilst in his cab from the office, he opened an envelope from Billy that Leone had given him. Inside was a roll of notes with a post-it: "Put a monkey on lightning speed at 3:20 p.m. Kempton." Banks screwed up the envelope and slotted the tightly rolled money into his top pocket. He paid his cab on Park Lane and walked into the Dorchester. He announced himself at reception, and wandered over to the lift. Oliver Messel Suite, please. Yes, sir. The bellboy was a tall, skinny, pale-faced boy who wore his tunic without confidence. Banks offered him a brief smile, hoping to encourage him. As he stepped from the lift. Menacing rugby prop-sized security in dark suits positioned themselves strategically in his way. Penetrating eyes risk-assessed his body language. He had come to meet with their boss, Rashid bin Abdullah Al Fahim, a Saudi sheikh, who was the Saudi shadow. They had met before under unpleasant circumstance. Rashid was a man of substance, a significant shareholder in Iafit. The Indo-Arabian Alliance for International Trade, a member of the Guard, and a constant frenemy of Lord Martin. The reason for his visit was unknown to him. However, research had provided something interesting. As in India, the dissident movement Red Band had taken control of certain cities in Saudi Arabia. Widespread public disobedience had culminated in the death of one hundred. And fifty-six activists, mown down by state militia, for refusing to disperse from the streets of Riyadh. As Banks entered the Oliver Messel suite, he was introduced by a valet. Rashid stood, allowing the volume and weight of his cream thwarp to cascade theatrically into beautiful folds, and leaving only his hands and the tips of his shoes uncovered. As salam alaykum. Banks accepted a kiss on both cheeks. They locked eyes briefly, then performed the secret handshake of the guard. There was deep, unresolved loyalties between them. It is, as always, a great pleasure to meet with you, Philip. The honor is all mine. They sat on a flowery settee, at ninety degrees to one another. Rashid wore a beard and moustache, and a simple cream headdress secured by a single cable of red silk. May I? Rashid motioned towards the tea set on the table. They had staff, so Banks felt spoilt. In my country, Oliver Messel would be seen as、uh, a challenge. We do not suffer the privations of political correctness that terrorise your country. He finished pouring Banks's tea, then started on his own. The suite was designed in the artwork of its namesake. I believe Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor stayed in this very suite," said Banks. Hence the old-fashioned decor. In my country, this would be risable. Please. Where is this going? Thought Banks. It is curious. When I am in Paris, I find myself seeking Twining's English breakfast tea. Yet here I am pouring French Earl Grey in London.
Of course. I seldom visit Paris after... And he referred to the recent anti-Muslim riots. Are you saddened by the decline of Paris? The question had never occurred to Banks, but he realized that it was loaded. Perhaps he did not know that Banks was engaged to marry Zara, who was herself Muslim. He decided not to mention that. Banks looked out through the patio doors. Quite a view. They led to an outdoor balcony with views over Hyde Park. I believe that you live not so far from here. Yes. He chided himself for being surprised. Men of such power have everyone they meet background checked scrupulously. Across the park, Lancaster Gate Hotel. I don't suppose you've heard of it? Quite humble compared to the Dorchester. Rashid rasped at his beard and grinned. He had never fixed his teeth. His incisors remained chaotic, with a signature overbite. I own many hotels in London, such as this. The Lancaster Gate has never come to market, but tell me, if it were to come to market, would you recommend that I buy? Only if you agree to redecorate. It is a little tired, if you know what I mean. Banks could sense that he was fishing. Rashid smiled. Perhaps there is something else you might recommend that I buy. As the only Saudi shadow, Banks knew that his pockets were deep. Warwink, perhaps. You are Lord Martin's water projects man, aren't you? I wouldn't know about that, replied Banks. However, I might recommend a blend of licorice tea that I discovered recently called Tenzing. Rashid's smile dropped. He suddenly looked fearsome, like he were capable of mass murder. Then his smile returned. I trust there are no leaves in your tea, because there is nothing less desirable than drinking tea with tea leaves floating in it. They can be so disrupting. Yes. Banks sipped at his tea. It came in a thin and delicate teacup, which he supposed to be made in England. All the while, Rashid's dark, dot-like eyes never left him. George tells me you are the man to talk to regarding our issue. Lord Martin flatters me. He had been debriefed on the Red Band protests across the kingdom. He tells me that you have a way of disseminating undesirable elements. His head tilted, expressing desire for confirmation. I understand replied Banks. What would you have me do with such undesirables? I leave that to you. Banks recalled that he had a copy of Rashid's book, My Grand Vision, in his office and wondered how much of it had been written by Rashid himself. I have read your book. It was comparable to the Nazi Ostla plan and detailed the creation of a Muslim exclusive Arabic empire stretching from Morocco to Iran. Oh, Rashid smiled and then laughed. A few thoughts. He rotated his hand airily. I hear congratulations are in order. Yes, thank you. Banks knew that Rashid would have done his due diligence and known that Zara was of French-Saudi heritage. You must come to my palace. Bring your wife. I shall invite you to the opening of our new Formula One track. It is the longest and most modern in the whole of the world. Thank you. That would be tremendous. My partner speaks Arabic. Her father is from Saudi Arabia. I know. Rashid rose.
And now... He waited for Banks to stand. Tell George that it would be wise to seek alliances for Warwick. I know that Peter is in discussions with Lee. Perhaps that was why he had been laying on so much charm, to warn Lord Martin that Lee of China and Peter of Russia were in cahoots against their bid, and hopefully to form an alliance with Lord Martin for Warwick, the African water conglomerate. They shook hands. It was a pleasure meeting you. They locked eyes briefly. Good day, Philip. As he left the Oliver Messel suite, security stood waiting either side of the open lift door. He thanked them and stepped into the lift. The bellboy inside pressed for ground floor and the lift began its descent. They dropped eight floors in silence and the lift doors opened. Have a good day, sir. Banks paused. Do you have a girlfriend? The bellboy looked a little out by the question. Yes, sir. Banks took the roll of five hundred pounds from his top pocket and stuffed it into the top pocket of the bellboy's tunic. Treat her. The bellboy's eyes popped open wide. Scene 6. The Occipital Worm Banks had been invited to a lecture at the offices of Ubiquity a computer analytics company owned by Delange Martin. Various traders from the city had gathered in a boardroom on the 64th floor of the cheese grater. Its glass wall provided a view over London's endless suburbs. The snaking Thames as it made its way towards the Essex estuary and low-flying aeroplanes heading towards Heathrow. 22 was there to deliver a speech on the implications to financial markets should hackers hit the kill switch on a national infrastructure control system. Stood at the window were a testosterone-heavy selection of high-flying traders bemoaning the fact that the girl who had been adjusting her dress in the window of an adjacent skyscraper had just walked out of sight. All in their late twenties to early thirties, they came from major trading companies and were mainly of European and American extraction. Each were unaware that their careers had been prearranged as part of a life research project under Ubiquity's care. It was 9.48 a.m. Most present had done their regular cardio-yogic workout, showered, caffeinated and tucked in three hours of trading already. Banks was on his third week of high alkaline black water hitting 95% at the Harrington Gun Club, sleeping six hours and producing dark stools that did not float. His hair had been razored to the hairline. He wore a single-breasted kaffir lime cotton jacket with saffron stitching and pencil-thin Persian blue necktie, hand-woven with Iranian geometrics. On his feet were blood-red brogues from Lob & Co, fitted with bespoke compartments in each heel, he could feel the weight of gold sovereign as in each heel as he walked. It did the trick. Hey, Phil, it was Jensen from Morgan's. Fuck you, Jensen, replied Banks politely. They had known each other for the best part of a decade. On the stroke of 10 a.m., two academics from the Health and Population Sciences Research Department of Birmingham University entered. One was a short Chinese woman, the other a tall red-headed man. Their morning had been far more leisurely, tea and cheese sandwiches aboard the high-speed train from Birmingham whilst reading the news. First to speak was Professor Jun Chen, a skinny woman with a head the shape of a macadamia nut. She wore large rectangular shaped glasses which due to the slope of her nose required her to tilt her head backwards and was disagreeably dressed in an off-the-peg grey suit which did nothing for her unflattering lank hair, which looked like it had been shaped by the rim of a soup bowl. Her meek voice did nothing to stir the alpha males before her. They were bored. Good morning, everyone. My name is Professor Jun Chen, 
I come from a part of the world that has experienced amazing growth in recent decades. Pause. Birmingham. Her humour was met with stony-faced contempt, which hardened as she detailed her academic credentials. She ran through some introductory slides, then introduced her co-researcher, a tall, muscular, straw-haired Englishman. Thank you for inviting me. I am Associate Professor Richard Stonegate, researcher in the field of health and population sciences. He spoke with a soft accent, eliciting a fraction more attention, if only as a man that traders might bully. He looped his long floppy hair over his ear and moved in an awkward fashion, revealing a feminine side which lost any interest the traders might have had in him. They moved their attention to Jensen, who was spinning a silver fountain pen between his fingertips. The demonstration of dexterity was eye-catching. He had perfected the trick in his teens, and for a moment even Stonegate was under his trance. Jensen abused the attention to score a childish point. I'm not disturbing you, am I, Professor? Stonegate looked confused. He questioned the limits of his authority in the environment of the city banksters. His visit came on the back of 12 months' research, funded by the university's most generous benefactor, Sir Owen Thomas. The president of Birmingham University had actually visited his department to wish him well before the visit. It was an honour he appreciated, a chance to see inside the City of London, to witness first-hand traders whose reputed earnings were several multiples of anyone at the university. Their behaviour was disappointingly juvenile. He pressed on. Professor Jun Chen is studying telepathic transference with regards to feminine intuition. Can she read my mind? It's saying, suck my dick. Stonegate gritted his teeth. My own field is that of biostatistics. Currently, we are quantifying the link between trader performance and preponderance of the occipital worm. He paused. A kind of boredom fashioned by supreme privilege radiated from the suits before him. Now you may be wondering what the study of worms has to do with trading forex. He made the mistake of smirking. Get on with it then, Einstein. The occipital worm resides in the back of the neck as its host. It thrives on serotonin produced by the host as they experience high levels of cognitive stress. Banks was staring at Stonegate, curious to the thought that there had been a Richard Stonegate at his old school, rugby. He had been a few years his junior. Our research proves that there is a direct link between those in finance, government, corporations, military, judicial and illicit activity, and those with high levels of occipital worm. Banks pointed his phone at Stonegate for confirmation. Richard Stonegate had attended rugby school for a few years before him. Will he remember me? First discovered in the early 90s, under a microscope, the occipital worm appears similar to the fetus of a mosquito. It has a head and a tail and is thought to have mutated from a common strain of bacteria. However, our research can find no geological family for it. In fact, it is similar to no other life form found on Earth. We are working with the hypothesis that it may have come via spaceman returning from the moon. The room went quiet. He continued, Although we can find no negative side effects, it is reproducing to an exponential, exponential rate, which leaves us with many questions. Where did it come from? What is its purpose and why is it on the increase? A trader from Barclays interjected. What has this got to do with Forex? I am glad you ask. Last year, we infected all of you with the occipital worm. Samples you gave to your doctor last month reveal dramatic change. Are you saying we have worms? Yes. There was mass anagnorisis. 
as traders realized that they were infected with worms. How do we get them? We introduce them. Wait, are you saying you gave us worms? Correct. If anyone has worms, it's the Deutsche guys, joked Jensen from Morgans. Fuck you, Jensen, replied Hanneman from Deutsche. Actually, infestation is in line with performance. Those of you who improved profitability over the year, Morgan Sachs, Barclays and Delange Martin, have higher levels of occipital worm than at the beginning of the year. Those of you from Deutsche and Credit Suisse whose performance has deteriorated over the last 12 months now show lower levels of occipital worm. Maybe the worms are taking over, suggested Fields from Barclays. Everyone laughed, except Richard Stonegate and Professor Jun Chen, who looked at one another with fear. At this stage, we cannot discount it. That's it. I'm fucking out of it. This is fucking joke. Worms, fuck you. Morgan Sachs traders began to walk. Joining you. Traders from Barclays stood too. The boardroom emptied, leaving just Banks, 22, Professor Jun Chen and Richard Stonegate. Uh, Philip Banks, you probably don't remember me. I started at rugby while you were leaving. Stonegate held out a hand, which Philip shook. There was no overt grip or evidence of secret handshake. He wasn't with the guard. Good to meet you. I hope you haven't infected me with worms too. You definitely have them. Banks frowned. All four relocated to Pacini's on the 22nd floor, where they ordered freshly cut pasta with pesto sauce and a, and a nebolio. The point is, the occipital worm is taking up all leading hosts, explained Stonegate passionately. When you say hosts, um, politicians, economists, scientists, executives, traders. You said you infected them. Yes, we did. But no, we didn't. So the traders are not infected. No, they are infected. We just didn't infect them. To be honest, we are not sure how they became infected. I don't understand, said Banks. This is nuts. What's the point? Professor Chen joined in. The point is, we are gaining a better understanding. But she was interrupted by Stonegate. They are colonizing people in positions of influence or power. Anyone important. And the darndest thing is, they appear to be controlling them. Controlling? How? It's a worm. We're not sure. But the pattern flows don't lie. We have the numbers. It's a fact. What Richard did not explain is that it is not worm, added Professor Chen, but a virus. Like a cold, suggested Banks. An infection, a virus, that can be treated. No, it is an AI virus. One that can transmit from computer to human and humour back to computer again. You have been listening to Overpopulation, the hidden agenda for global reset. Book three in the Philip Banks trilogy by Robert Salisbury.